I'm under strict orders not to make fun of Blake about anything, or I won't ever be asked back. But, uh, if, any, if any of you follow both him and uh, me on Twitter, you know we have a little battle going over exercise. He's, he's always tweeting out those uh, cowbell exercises or whatever they are that he does, and, and how many push-ups and pull-ups, and I always have some smart aleck comment about it. My, He's the, he, he the exercisingest nut you've ever met in your life? Yeah, my idea of exercise is take a bath, pull the plug, and fight the current. <laughs> let me, uh, before I get into the word over in Exodus, let me say a, a couple of words. First of all, I want to commend the church at Edmond here. Uh, I don't know how how often you realize that uh, FBC Edmond comes up in conversations around the state and around the convention. And uh, just uh, a couple of weeks ago, we were having a discussion, several of us, and commending this church for the testimony it has uh, had for over 100 years. And one of the things that is really of ministry to, uh, to, to individuals around the state and around the nation, as a matter of fact, is the testimony of a hundred years with four pastors. That's incredible. Uh, and it, uh, it is a testimony that uh, I hope this congregation guards uh, closely. And you have a wonderful new pastor in Blake, good friend of mine. Uh, I was a good friend with Alan. And uh, God has blessed this church uh, greatly with wonderful pastors. But you've been a blessing to your pastors for in a hundred years. Let me give you a real quick uh, reminder of how significant that is. I just went back last summer to my first pastorate, Hendricks, Oklahoma. Wonderful group of believers, but uh, uh, they were celebrating their 100th anniversary, <laughs> and we've had at that little church 40-something pastors. So, so I, I want to commend you. This is just incredible. Secondly, I want to uh, say that I bring greetings from your university, Oklahoma's Baptist University in Shawnee, and report to you that uh, we continue to be blessed by God. Uh, enrollment is increasing. Looks like we're going to have a record enrollment this fall, and uh, we're very appreciative of your students, uh, your support, and most of all, your prayers. Uh, you may or may not know, I hope you do, that OBU is the highest rated college in Oklahoma according to the 2013 rankings of U.S. News & World Report. And uh, there you go. <laughs> Princeton Review has it ranked in its top 125 schools. And then Forbes Magazine ranks it in the top five schools in Oklahoma. U.S. News & World Report 2013 rankings of the entire Western United States. Can you give me of all the liberal arts colleges in the entire Western United States, the 10th highest rated college? No, 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 it's not OBU. I, I don't even know who number 10 is. Uh, we're number five on that ranking, yeah. But let me tell you what I'm most uh, thankful for and what I think our founders would be most thankful for. Um, and that is, again, this year, I visited with Tom Elliff just a couple of months ago, and again this year, he reports that more missionaries serving around the world through the International Mission Board have a degree from Oklahoma Baptist University than any other university in the world. And that's your university. Well, this morning I'm going to be uh, preaching out of Exodus. If you want to make your way over to chapter 32, you'll be in the right, uh, right spot. I've uh, never talked uh, much about fashion in church, although if I was going to tease Blake about anything other than exercise, it would be about fashion. He is the best dressed redneck I've ever met in my life. <laughs> I grew up in Wayne, Oklahoma. Now, I know a lot of people go around bragging they're from Wayne, Oklahoma, but I really am. And, and uh, if you look at our class picture, for the, uh, for the annual uh, in, in 1980, the, the seniors, there, there I am with my class of 43, and uh, I'm, I'm wearing what I normally wear, uh, would wear to school. I'm wearing roundhouse overalls. And, and so I set the stage early. I'm just not much on fashion. I don't wear jewelry at all. I wear a wedding ring on my left finger so that, uh, like our young brother did this morning in the baptistry, 
uh, I want the whole world to know I love somebody, and more important, somebody loves me. And that's, the, that's sort of the pe- picture we got this morning with that baptism. And, and that's pretty much it. Sometimes I'll wear a class ring. Sometimes I'll, uh, the, the swim team won the national championship, and they gave me a ring, one of those big honking uh, championship rings. Sometimes I'll wear that if I'm feeling particularly gaudy. And, uh, <laughs> but I don't know much about jewelry. However, this morning's sermon is going to be about jewelry. I'll confess, I must have a desire to have a pierced ear because several years ago I I dreamt that I had a pierced, got my ears pierced and got Mickey Mouse earrings and then then decided I needed to take them out and went back and and, uh, the, the clerk at Walmart, because in my dreams I shop at Walmart, she, uh, she explained to me that uh, I had to leave men for four months. I don't know what the dream was about other than I was real embarrassed when I woke up. We had just voted as the convention that year to boycott uh, Walt Disney. and So, so there's probably something deep-seated there about my rebellion. Uh, but but uh, other than that, I really don't think or dream about jewelry. But this morning's sermon is about jewelry. Uh, it, 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 and, and the message is this, sometimes jewelry goes bad. Uh, it, it takes a special light to shine upon that jewelry to determine whether or not it's gone bad or not. But if you put this special light on jewelry, you can, you can determine whether there are pits or scars or blemishes in the stones. Deep, it looks deep into stones, for example, and, and, and can determine if jewelry has gone bad. And, and, and for those of you that take notes, the title of the sermon is Good Jewelry Gone Bad good jewelry gone bad. This morning what I want to do is to shine this special light on the jewelry in our lives and determine if any of our jewelry has gone bad. The, the, uh, the special light that I want to shine on our jewelry is none other than the Word of God. And the jewelry I want us to examine are any of those things that we adorn our lives with, any of those things that are treasured by us, whether it be a relationship or um, a position uh, a job, uh, what, whatever it is, I want us to shine the light of God's Word this morning on it to determine whether any of it's gotten blemished or whether any of it's good jewelry gone bad, ju- jewelry that's wrong or even evil. And now I'm going I'm, I'm to ask you to read with me in Exodus chapter 32. We'll read a few verses and then skip over and uh, go down toward the end. But we'll start with verse 1 in chapter 32. Famous story, infamous story of the golden calf in uh, Exodus. Chapter 32, verse 1. Now when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aaron and said to him, Come, make us gods that shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what has become of him. And Aaron said to them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters. Interestingly, sons had earrings back then too. And bring them to me. So all the people broke off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and he fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a molded calf. Then they said, and isn't this just some of the saddest words you'll read in the Bible? They said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. So when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. Then they rose early on the next day, offered burnt offerings, and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play, the old King James says, to revel. And the Lord said to Moses, Go, get down, for your people whom you've brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They've turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They've made themselves a molded calf and worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I've seen this people, and indeed it is a stiff-necked people. 
then ensues a conversation, uh, the topic of another sermon for another time between God and uh, Moses, where Moses begins to intervene on behalf of the people to spare the people, and he does so successfully. And then we're going to pick it back up uh, down around verse, um, let's see, let's go down to verse uh, 15. And Moses turned and went down from the mountain, and the two tablets of the testimony were in his hand. The tablets were written on both sides, on the one side and on the other they were written. Now the tablets were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, There is a noise of war in the camp. But he said, Moses did, It's not the noise of the shout of victory nor the noise of the cry of defeat, but the sound of singing I hear. Now, I heard, uh, honest to goodness, I heard a radio preacher uh, preach that very verse uh, <laughs> several years ago, and he was railing about uh, that, uh, that, the, that was a, a clear indication that God did not approve of rock music, uh, the, the loud shout of victory. I think he missed the whole point, don't you? It's clearly it was rap. So... <laughs> Oh, maybe not. I don't know. Verse 19, So it was, as soon as he came near the camp, that he saw the calf and the dancing. So Moses' anger became hot, and he cast the tablets out of his hands, and he broke them at the foot of the mountain. Then he took the calf, which they had made, burned it in the fire, and ground it to powder, and he scattered it on the water and made the children of Israel drink it. And Moses said to Aaron, What did this people do to you that you brought so great a sin upon them? So Aaron said, Do not let the anger of my Lord become hot. You know the people that they're set on evil, for they said to me, Make us gods that shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what's become of him. And I said to them, Whoever has any gold, let him break it off. So they gave it to me, and I cast it into the fire, and this calf came out. Now when Moses saw that the people were unrestrained, for Aaron had not restrained them to their shame amongst their enemies, then Moses stood in the entrance of the camp and said, Whoever is on the Lord's side, come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together to him. And he said to them, Thus saith the Lord, God of Israel, let every man put his sword on his side and go in and out from entrance to entrance throughout the camp, and let every man kill his brother, every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. So the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses and about 3,000 men of the people fell that day. Perhaps one of the saddest stories in the Bible. God had already delivered them out of Egypt. They had been oppressed for hundreds of years. They were enslaved and, 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 and being abused and, a, and an operation of genocide had, had been enacted against them. They cried out to God. God heard them, sent them a deliverer named Moses who came to lead them out. And after ten marvelous signs there in the land of Egypt, the ten plagues with all the gnats and the frogs and, 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 and the lightning and the hail and the swarming insects, all the time the Israelites were protected. Right? And then the final, the tenth plague had come. All of these signs of God's wonder and the fact that he's about to deliver them out of the land of Egypt. And that last plague, the death of the firstborn, uh, spared only uh, to those who took the blood of a lamb and put it over the doorpost and lintels of their homes. Where the death angel passed over them, struck the firstborn of every one of the house of Egypt. Everyone who did not abide the word of God and put the blood of the lamb over their lives. You remember that? They saw all of that miraculous. And, you, and you'll recall on that 10th plague that, that uh, Pharaoh and all the people then said, that's enough, just leave us. Go, go and worship how you please. Take all the children, take all your animals, do whatever you need to do, just go. And so they left, they, marked out, they marched out victoriously, seeing the hand of God these are the same people that are now turning their back on God. These are the same people who saw the, the bitter waters made whole. Miracle after miracle after miracle. These are the same people who, who, who witnessed a pillar of fire 
uh, by night and a pillar of cloud by day to cover them and shield them as the very sign of the presence of God. You want to know that God's with you? There's the pillar of fire and, and, the, and, the, and the cloud by day. Isn't that an incredible thing? By the way, they're, they're rebelling against God and they can still see the cloud. The cloud, the, the fire is still there. Moses has gone up the mountain. He, he's gone on this retreat. He's gone 40 days and 40 nights. And what's happening there is that he's receiving the instructions from God. Do you know why he's, why he's up there? They, they didn't want to go up there. Uh, he's up there receiving all of the commandments on how the tabernacle is to be built. He's receiving the, 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 the uh, Ten Commandments that, uh, that are going to be written down, but that the people had already heard with their own ears from the mouth of God. A lot, a lot of us skip over that section back in Exodus 20. Uh, they're gathered around the mountain of God, and they set up barriers because the presence of God goes onto the mountain and it's holy. He just envelops the mountain and there's thundering and quaking and the people are absolutely afraid. And, and, and they all hear the voice of God speak from the cloud and the fire. And he gives them ten commandments. Here's the covenant. Now, this is free. I've done this uh, at, at a couple of places. I've... Uh, I got taught this by a nine-year-old, but uh, I, I'm reminded of a, an old movie back in the, I think it was the 70s, uh, and I haven't seen it since then, so I'm not recommending it. It's probably just a terrible, uh, gosh-awful movie, but I remember a scene out of it. It was a Burt Reynolds movie, and I think the title of it was The End. Uh, does anybody ever remember that? Uh, he, he actually wanted to die, and and so he was trying to to uh, take his own life and then this uh, I think it was the final scene I'm gonna blow it for you uh, like you're gonna watch it um, he he's he, he just swims out into the ocean and he gets out into the ocean and suddenly he starts realizing he's got a child that he wants to watch grow up and all of a sudden he realizes you know life is more than what I've been making it and he has this epiphany of sorts he he suddenly decides like George Bailey standing on the edge of the bridge that he wants to live and he begins to turn around exhausted and swimming back and he begins to bargain with God and he starts praying God if I make it back I'll obey all Ten Commandments uh, thou shalt not murder uh, thou shalt not steal uh, thou Lord he said I'll learn the Ten Commandments if I get back uh, I suspect that most of us don't know the Ten Commandments we could name three or four of them but I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna teach the Ten Commandments to you you'll never forget them again give me three minutes let me give me four um, a big crowd maybe five uh, five tops you'll you'll forever know the Ten Commandments you'll be able to recite them frontwards backwards somebody will say what's the fourth commandment you'll be able to tell it they'll say what's the seventh what's the first you'll go back and forth you'll, you'll have it ready but but it requires a little uh, visual uh, and kinesthetic uh, learning combination so you're gonna have to give me your hands free for just a minute and I'm gonna teach you the Ten Commandments alright we're gonna start with one and so we're gonna hold up this finger and say one this is the easy one there is only one God that's the first commandment what's what's commandment number one well you just flick your fingers there's just one God and then you hold up two fingers and and the second commandment and then just that's a pair of scissors remember just to cut out idols cut out idols out of your life one God cut out idols no other no other gods before him don't don't engrave uh, don't make engraved images and don't make idols and bow down before them cut them out just cut it out, right? And then the third commandment is uh, just do like that and then put it over your mouth. Uh, watch what you say. Do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Be careful what you say. Look, you've already, you've already done three commandments. You've learned them. One, one God, cut out idols. Watch what you say. Don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain. This guy should be in education. Number four. This is your four tires, and you're going to rotate your tires and drive to church every Sunday. 
all right? Or if you prefer a healthy thing, just two people walk together to church every Sunday, right? Number four, rotate the tires, drive to church. Four tires on your car, get to church every Sunday. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Number five, this is actual American Sign Language. So this, this you're, you're getting a two for one here. I'm told by American Sign Language teachers that uh, this is father and this is mother. So the fifth commandment is honor your father and honor your mother. Oh, father, mother. Uh, the sixth commandment, this is brutal, I'm, I apologize. Sixth commandment. <coughs> sixth commandment. <coughs> Don't commit murder. Uh, if, you're, uh, if you're against handguns, sixth commandment is stabbing, so you can do that. And actually, that's American Sign Language for murder, too, I'm told. No, six. Seventh commandment is, uh, is uh, five and two, like that. Seventh commandment, just remember those two people there. Always stay together. Don't commit adultery. Don't go getting married to other people. Don't go seeing other people. Stick together. Two man and wife supposed to stick together. That's forever. Number eight. You hold up like this. Now, I don't know. I've traveled uh, 33 nations, and uh, I'm told in a couple of those that I've traveled that one, one of the, uh, one of the uh, crimes they don't have any toleration for is, is stealing. And if they, if they catch you stealing, they'll cut your thumbs off. So, so don't steal. Nine. Ninth command, uh, eighth commandment is don't steal. Eighth commandment is don't steal. And then the ninth commandment uh, is like that. No, I'm telling you, this is, this is it. This is all I've got. No, see, I'm lying to you, aren't I? I'm, I'm hiding something from you back here. I'm lying. I'm bearing false witness against my neighbor. I'm, I'm telling a lie. So the ninth commandment is don't lie. Uh, don't bear false witness. And then the tenth commandment, maybe the second easiest one, is just like this. Gimme, 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 gimme. Uh, that's coveting. Thou shalt not covet. So now... If you'll practice that through two times when you get home today, you'll never forget any of the Ten Commandments. And someone will say to you, and you can have your spouse or your mom or dad test you, what's the Fourth Commandment? Down below the table where nobody has a seat, just go, rotate the tires. Yeah. Go to church every Sunday. Remember the Sabbath. Keep it holy. Or if somebody says, what's the Sixth Commandment? You can just go here. To... <laughs> Sixth Commandment is not uh, to commit murder. And uh, if, if they say, well, what's the Third Commandment? You go, third goes over your mouth. Okay, uh, uh, don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Now, here's the deal. They heard these from the voice of God, thundering from the mountain. They had all heard it at the base of Mount Sinai, and they begged Moses, you go up and you get the details of the tabernacle. You go up and you get the details of, of how we're to worship. You go up and you get these things recorded as they're supposed to be recorded on the tablets. Uh, we'll, we'll wait here. And so the intermediary, Moses, went up the mountain and for 40 days received instructions including those Ten Commandments that they'd all heard and all agreed to and all said, yes, yes, we'll make that covenant. And now, 40 days later, after seeing all of these miracles, seeing the presence of God still with their own eyes, and by the way, gathering up, during this time of 40 days of away, gathering up six days a week and on the sixth day enough for the seventh manna that's been miraculously put on the ground every morning and water from a rock as they're gathering water from a rock, this marvelous ongoing miracle as they're gathering manna from the ground, this ongoing miracle from heaven, they choose to rebel against them and break the first two commandments. One, God, no other gods before him. Two, they didn't cut out idols. In fact, they gathered all their jewelry together at the behest of Aaron, Moses' brother, and had him fashion an idol for them to bow down and worship. Don't you know that broke God's heart? 40 days. What's become of Moses? We need to be like other nations. We, we need to be progressive and, and, have a, and have a king, they would later argue. We, we, need, to, we need to fashion ourselves on the, on the secular nations of the world. No, God had them set apart. And it must have grieved his heart. In fact, he confronts Moses. Your people you brought out, they've already broken the covenant. 
And so Moses and, uh, goes down, gathers Joshua to him and, and witnesses this and, and sees the revelry that's going on. And by the way, if you read between the lines, you see that they weren't just breaking the first two commandments. There's every indication they were laying it all on the line. I mean, it was debauchery. Moses see it, sees it and he does a couple of things. He does a couple of things that I don't think would have been lost on that group, but sometimes it's lost on us. Uh, one thing he does is he takes the, he takes the golden calf and he, and, he, and he has it brought to him and he grinds it into fine powder, burns it and grinds it into fine powder and he casts it out on the water. And then he tells the people, drink it. And they did. Now, that seems unusual, but I, I really don't think it would have been lost on them. I, I, I think it would have been clearly understood by them the worthlessness, number one, of the idol, and number two, the fact that they're consuming it uh, wouldn't have been lost on them either. Uh, it, it's a principle of uh, that which you worship becomes a part of you. Um, that which you worship, you consume. It, it becomes one with you. And it must have been a very sad act and understood by them. By the way, we still practice that today, don't we? Uh, we gather uh, around the Lord's table and we break the bread and we pour the fruit of the vine and we repeat the words of Jesus, take this, my broken body, eat. Take this, my blood, drink. We consume it. We're identifying with. He's become part of us. It's communion with God. An outward sign of a, of a, of a, a visible sign of an inward truth. I don't think that would have been lost on them. Uh, he, 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 uh, he, he not only uh, does that, but he actually casts the tablets down and shatters the tablets. And I don't think that would have been lost on them either. The covenant is broken, just shattered. You break one, you're as guilty as breaking all ten. You, 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 you've absolutely, absolutely broken the covenant. Here's the sign of the covenant, the Ten Commandments that you all agreed to 40 days ago, and they're smashed. And I think that would have been sad. Hearts of The heart of God was grieving, the heart of Moses and and uh, Joshua were grieving and uh, the, there was no mistake about what was going on in terms of the covenant being broken and them having consumed or become identified and having this idol worship as a part of them. Uh, he, he, he then asked uh, Aaron a question. He, he said, Aaron, what on earth did this people do to you? that you've brought such shame and degradation to them? What on earth happened? And Aaron uttered what is got to be the worst lie ever uttered. He said, well, you, first of all, I tried to blame it on others. Isn't that pretty typical of you and me? When we get caught doing something, it's always somebody else. Well, you know the people, how evil. They're bent, they're bent on evil, Moses. You know that. Now, you know these people. And they said, what's happened to Moses? For the, uh, we're getting nervous. And they were panicked. And, and I was just trying to bring uh, uh, some order to it. I, I don't really know what happened. I, I, I said, well, break off your golden earrings. And they brought, brought me gold. And I cast it into the fire. And out came this calf. I mean, it's, it's almost comical. Were, were it not so tragic? I have uh, I've often uh, thought about that moment and and uh, and actually that response and I'll say more about it in a minute but uh, as I was reading through this uh, several years ago it it hit me where on the earth did a bunch of these people were slaves just weeks earlier they, they had nothing they were totally dependent for on on the Egyptians for everything they owned nothing they were poverty stricken slaves Where'd they get a bunch of jewelry? Where'd they get a bunch of gold? That's what makes the story even more tragic. They, they didn't even have the straw to make bricks with. And now they've got gold? Well, you know where they got it. And that's what makes the story even sadder. 
on that last night in Egypt, that last morning rather, when, uh, when the Pharaoh and all the people said, just go, take your belongings and leave. Well, they didn't have much belongings, but do you know what God impressed the Egyptians to do? You remember that scene? He impressed the Egyptians to plunder themselves and heap it upon the Israelites who were leaving. They brought out fine clothing and heaped it upon the Israelites who were leaving. They brought out silver and gold and jewelry by the tons and, and just tunned it on top of these departing Israelites as a victorious army would have marched out having plundered a city that was a volunteer, voluntarily uh, plundered nation. It was a gift of God. They took the blessings of God and they fashioned it into gold. They took good jewelry. There wasn't anything wrong with the jewelry. That there's, that the jewelry was fine in and of itself, but they took a good gift from God and they fashioned it into a golden calf. What they had was good jewelry gone bad. And good jewelry goes bad any time we take it and fashion it into something that is put in the place of the one who gave it. Does that make sense? Well, this golden calf, what a sad and, and a tragic story. But it didn't end there, did it? Moses declared uh, that there would be uh, a plague. And we didn't read about the plague that came upon them, but we do read about some of the, some of the punishment that came on. It was death and destruction. Uh, Moses said, whoever's on the Lord's side, come to me. He, 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 he figuratively, he may have literally, I don't know, drawn a line in the sand and said, whoever is on the Lord's side, come to me. And all the sons of Levi crossed over and he said, take your swords and kill every man who doesn't cross over. Every woman, every child, everyone who remains in rebellion. And thousands died that day. Isn't that just sad? But isn't that a truth about sin? Sin always... 100% of the time, not almost always, not just virtually always, but in reality, 100% of the time, always sin, regardless of the type, always ends in destruction and death. That's the end of sin, destruction and death. This is just playing out for us to see it in a graphic way. Sin always results in death and destruction. In a marriage, the destruction of a family, if sin enters in, potentially. In a church, a church split, if sin enters in, it's always destruction of what exists, and ultimately, death. And here we see both. What, what, a, what a sad, sad picture in God's uh, word of the picture of sin and, uh, and, and, and the picture of false worship. And, and, uh, and it all boils down to what happened and Aaron's crazy response. I don't know. I threw it in the fire and out came this calf. I, 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 I've got to confess to you, over the years, I've taken a lot more pity on Aaron in this response than I did the first several years that I would read through this chapter. Uh, over the years, being, being a bivocational pastor and and, uh, and, and dealing with uh, sad situations where sin comes in and destroys. And, and uh, I've, I've encountered a lot of people who really don't have anything better to say than what Aaron did. I, I've, been in the, I've been in the place where I couldn't come up with anything much better than what he said. Because I'm reading it a little different these days in my 50s. I'm reading it this way. I'm reading it with this kind of an inflection. I don't know, Moses. I just cast it in the fire. And out came this calf. I don't know how it happened. One day it was this, and before I knew it, it had become this. And so somebody prays for a spouse to share their life with. God, if you just give me someone to share my life with, that's all I want. If you just answer that prayer. And, and sure enough, someone enters in. And what starts out as good and fine and, and uh, absolutely blessed, over time can become distorted. Good jewelry gone bad. 
and, and, and you find young people, uh, but not just young people, who get so enamored with the relationship that they forget who answered the prayer to begin with. And they become uh, the person who is put in the place of the one who blessed them to begin with. They put that person, that relationship, in the place of God. You know that's happened, right? They put this relationship, and so Bible study, well, I really want to hang out with so-and-so, or, or uh, there's this opportunity to, 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 to go to Falls Creek. Well, I, I can't be away from so-and-so for the, that many days. Don't you just grit your teeth when you hear stuff like that? Um, you set the relationship in, ship up in the place of God. God blessed you. He, he delivered you and he blessed you with blessings on top of that. And now you're turning and taking the blessings of God and putting them in the place of God. You're disobeying the first two commandments. And it breaks the heart of God. And so somebody prays, if I just had a job, if I just had a way to, to, uh, to make money to provide for my family uh, and, and so we could have a comfortable living, I, I just need that job. By the way, uh, I hope that you're past the point of being identified with your job. Uh, uh, I hope that you're past the point of even thinking that my job is simply a means to an end. It's simply, and, and Christians, we do this oftentimes. We think we're going to be super spiritual and say, my job doesn't matter. It's just the means for me to provide for my family. That's not true. That's certainly high among the priorities. But your, God is to, your job is to glorify God through your work. God gives you a job so that you can glorify him in that work. Right? You're, 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 a, you're a testimony of what you believe about God in terms of your work ethic. You are to glorify God with whatever he's assigned you to do. Your work matters. Well, uh, God, give me, give me a way to glorify you. Give me a way that I can, that I can provide for my family and glorify you. And, and God gives you a job. And pretty soon, you take that job and you put it in the place of God. And you've seen this happen. You start serving the job as opposed to serving God through the job. And pretty soon you're missing church, you're, you're missing family uh, outings because, well, what in reality this uh, job has become is not a, not a means to provide for your family, although it does that. Not, not a means to, to, uh, to, to witness to others about, uh, about God through your work, but it becomes the end in itself. That corner office is almost mine. That shop foreman's job is almost mine. If I do this, if I angle this way, if I bring this person down, if I, if I manipulate the situation, if I'm able to just do these few things, then I'll, then I'll have this position of authority that I deserve. And see, we take the jewelry God gives us and we put it up in the place of God. Here's the reality. One of the reasons I love Exodus is it's such a marvelous picture of what God's done in our lives as believers. Because we, like those Israelites, were enslaved. We were oppressed. We were under a curse of death. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, and we were all under that, that awful, awful curse of death. And at some point we cried out, God deliver us and he sent us a mediator. He sent us a deliverer a, a, a pictured by Moses but in reality the one true final sacrifice God came down as the, as the son Jesus and led us out of enslavement. Led us out of oppression by his death on a cross by his burial and then his resurrection three days later. He, he conquered death for us and he set us free. And so these Israelites who prayed, God, d deliver us. He sends Moses and now they march out victoriously into this wonderful new adventure with God as a nation belonging to God. And we do the same thing. It was a picture of the Christian coming to faith in Jesus. In fact, Peter says, you're a royal priesthood, a holy nation. I'm making you... A part, a part of the, apart from the world, into a nation belonging to me. You're going to be saints unto the God, unto God, and and so He delivers us out of this oppression into this marvelous adventure. And somewhere along the way, and by the way, not uh, just a real quick point. That that would be enough, Amen. 
If all he did was forgive you of your sins and say, nothing on your, nothing on your account that's against you. If that's all he did, pay the price for our sins, that would be enough. But our God keeps on blessing on top of that. Not only does he forgive us, he adopts us into his kingdom, makes us part of his own nation. And that would be enough. That's a blessing on top of a blessing. And yet, that's not where God stops. He just heaps gold and silver and jewelry on us in, in so many different ways. He puts blessings upon top of blessings, and pretty soon, we start looking at the blessings. We start looking at the gold that we've gotten from him. We start looking at the jewelry we've gotten, and we get focused on that, and we're no better than those silly Israelites who made a golden calf out of theirs because when we put a relationship up in front of the relationship with God, when we put a job, when we put status, when we put recognition, when we put uh, relationships, when we put anything in the rightful place of God, when we start, cho when we start choosing to worship the, the thing instead of the one who gave the thing, then we've got good jewelry gone bad. We've made golden calves. And so you ask the young woman or young man who who hasn't been to church in a while and and uh, and and what happened with this relationship it started out so pure and now it's gone haywire what happened I, I have a suspicion that the best they can mutter is something like this you hear it said a thousand different ways here's the way I hear it now I don't know brother David I don't know how it happened I just threw it in the fire and out came this golden calf. And you confront the, 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 the gentleman who, who uh, has uh, suddenly found himself worshiping the job as opposed to using it as a means to provide for his family and as the tool by which he glorifies God. And you ask them, what in the world happened? God blessed you with this and now you're serving the, the, the job itself. What happened? The best they can do is often nothing more than, I don't know what happened. I just threw it in the fire and out came this golden calf. Now some of us got, we've got uh, good jewelry gone bad in our lives. Why don't you let God's light shine on it? God's bringing things to your mind even now. Things that are good jewelry gone bad. You, you, you've, you've seen in the light of God's word the pits, the problems, in some cases the pure evil that's enshrouded in that jewelry. Now here's my suggestion. Um, two, two suggestions. One, do what Moses did. Get rid of it. If you're serving, get rid of it. Free yourself from it, however that needs to happen. Second is this, and this is the most important. Because I wouldn't leave you with a sermon like this. In fact, God's word never leaves us without good news. I wouldn't leave you without some good news. And it's pictured right here. Uh, kind of tucked away there in the midst of the story. Uh, Moses says, in light of all of this, Moses says, now, whoever is on the Lord's side, come to me. Isn't that marvelous? Don't you love it? The sign of God's grace, even at the midst of one of the most horrifying crimes against God, is this message of grace embedded in. It's still not too late to get right. After all they had done, Moses said, Now, whoever is on the Lord's side, cross to me. And we know hundreds of thousands did because... Uh, because only a few thousand died. Tragically, a few thousand died, but hundreds of thousands crossed over. Here's the message, uh, and, and here's the invitation this morning sent by this church, sent by our Savior. Number one, if you're a Christian, and uh, you've seen through this light this morning some good jewelry gone bad, I suggest that you... Uh, that you just give that back to God and that you make it right that you repent confess it he already knows confess it and ask God to restore a 
right heart within you. And the altar is open for that during this time of invitation. Um, the other invitation is this. If you've never trusted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, he did come on this earth to pay the price for your sins. He lived a perfect life, became the perfect sacrifice, was, was, was crucified on a cross, died in your place so that you never have to, was buried, three days later rose again, ministered, was witnessed by hundreds of people, 500 on one occasion alone, and some 40 days later ascended into heaven before the eyes of the apostles, before the eyes of his disciples with this promise, I'm coming back the same way I'm leaving. And he is coming back. He is coming back. Amen. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Oh, I hope you're ready. If you've never trusted Jesus, I, I pray that you would repent of your sin, turn your back on that bad jewelry that you've got. Turn your back on the sin in your life and ask Christ to forgive you. Trust in Christ. Just pray and ask him to forgive you. And then come share that during this time of invitation. There will be several ministers from this church uh, here to receive you, to talk with you, to, to, to uh, pray with you. And they'll stay as long as you need. Even if we finish up a hymn, hymn of invitation and you still need some time, we'll just go off down in the hall and have some private discussion with you. And the third invitation is this. If you're uh, a believer and, and uh, God's leading you to be a part of this church, this church welcomes you and would uh, welcome you to come down and, and place your desire to be in membership and go through whatever the process is that this church has for new members. But this would be a wonderful place to serve. Listen, this is a wonderful place to serve, a place that has had four pastors in a hundred years. This is not some squirrely church. This is solid. This is a good place to be. Amen. The invitation is open. Let, let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, forgive those of us who belong to you, who've been saved. Forgive us for violating the first two commandments with the blessings that you've given us. For the jewelry we fashion into golden calves, we repent. Whether they're relationships, possessions, positions. And Father, for those of us who belong to you and think we've blown it, well, we have. And yet Moses' words still ring true. Even when we blow it, the invitation is made to cross over and get right. I pray that you would make our hearts right this morning. And for those who have never trusted you, Father, give them faith even now that they might believe on Jesus and confess with their mouths that he is Lord and that they would share that with one of these here at the front. And for those who you are leading to be a part of this church, I pray that you speak to them and have them obey your command. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.